chapter 2, verse 6, and Romans chapter 5, verse 17 are our two foundational scriptures tonight. Ephesians 2, 6 and Romans 5, 17. This is part three of our series called Take a Seat. And it's about us taking a seat in Christ, in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named. Ephesians 2, 6 basically says that we've been raised up and seated together in Christ. When he was raised, how many of you know you were raised because you were in him? So in him, you were raised up and you were seated together in heavenly places. Amen. Romans 5, 17 says that we receive the gift of righteousness and abundance of grace. And because that we can reign in life by the one man, Jesus Christ. And many translations say reign as kings in life. So God wants you to live like a king. Can you say that? God wants me to live like a king. Amen. Kings have dominion, power, and wealth, don't they? Dominion, power, and wealth. God wants you to have all three of those things, and Jesus actually paid for you to have an inheritance. Now, it's not just a, you know, a bunch of money. It's what Jesus paid for you to have. It's in a divine inheritance. And so the last two weeks, the first week of this series, part one was talking about our identity in Christ. Because if you're going to take your place seated in Christ, you have to forego all your earthly identities and take on as your primary identity the, the identity as a son of God raised up together, seated with Christ in heavenly places. And I'm telling you, you can't have an identity on earth that's better than that. So, you know, you might as well throw out any other identities that you're, you're holding on to because they're just holding you back. Take on the primary idea, identity that you have, which is a son or a daughter of the king. Amen? That's, that's who we are in Christ Jesus. And we can reign in life. So we need to know who we are. And we've covered that. Number two, we need to know what we have. We talked about that last week, about our inheritance in Christ Jesus. Uh, this week, I want to start talking about authority, spiritual authority, dominion that every believer has. And, but few of us are walking in it. And I don't know anybody that's walked in it to the degree that it's available. How many of you want to walk in the authority that Christ paid for you to have? and the dominion Christ paid for you to have, and have as the results of understanding and walking in that a different life and a different impact than what's been up until now. Thank God for everything we have seen and everything we have walked in, but I want to go up to another level of understanding, revelation, and how about experience? How about you? Amen. Psalms, so we're talking about part three, which is authority reigning as kings with Christ. Now, Psalms chapter 115 and verse 16 says, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he hath given to, to the children of men. Did you hear that? The heaven, even the heavens, plural, are the Lord's, but the earth has he given to the children of men. Now, that verse is ripe with revelation because many people are under the false impression that everything that's going on on this planet was God's decision and, and he's involved in everything that happens. And as soon as you read this, you've got to understand he's given the earth to the children of men. So when you see things that are in a mess, it isn't because God's a mess. It's because the wrong people are in control. Amen. The wrong spirit <laughs> is, is having an influence. And so we're going to talk about that and, and get to that. But when God created the earth, you know, this verse alludes to the fact of Genesis 1, And I know many of you know this verse, but maybe some of you don't. Or some of you, you know, even if you know something, how many of you know, nobody has ever exhausted all the revelation out of any scripture in the Bible. Nobody has. And it's not what you say you know mentally, it's what is happening in your life. And uh, that's why every, I love reading the Bible, because every time I read the Bible, I find stuff that I've never walked in before, but belongs to me, like I've never walked on water, right? I hope one day to have the testimony of walking on water in this life, because it's, it's, it's happened in the Bible, it's available, so why not have everything? That'd be pretty cool to 
pool party, wouldn't it? You know, instead of you going swimming, you just walk out on the water, go somewhere there's a lot of sinners, just walk out on the water and start preaching the gospel while standing on the water. That would be a pretty good sign and wonder to get their attention, wouldn't it? Amen. So Genesis 126, this is such an important verse talking about authority. And Genesis 126, God says this, let us make man in our image according to our likeness Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Sounds like he gave us complete dominion, doesn't it? How many of you can say amen? Are you live out there? All right. Talk talk back to me. Let me hear you. Dominion. Now, let's look at this word dominion. It's really an important word in the Bible. The word dominion is to have jurisdiction. It means to be great and powerful. It means to make someone Lord. It means to bear rule, to prevail. It also means royal sovereignty. So think about this. God gave you and me dominion. Isn't that amazing when you read that? Uh, In other words, he made man the Lord of the earth, or he gave man dominion over the earth. Now, you know, religion doesn't like to talk about this because religion thinks this is taking some kind of glory away from God, but it's not. It's actually showing just how generous our God is and how good our God is. And and we're going to keep going in this. You're going to see a lot of things, I believe. So originally, God gave man dominion, authority over planet earth, but then the snake showed up in the garden, didn't he? And he tempted man to disobey the only and the one condition God had put on man. You can do everything. You can eat from anything, but just this one thing, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? Of course, we know the rest of the story. (laughs) Adam and Eve did what most of us would have ended up doing, so we can't blame them, right? They ended up eating that fruit, and they ended up falling and being, and and being separated from God, and they had to leave the Garden of Eden because if they would if they would have stayed there, the Tree of Life was there, and they would have eaten the Tree of Life, they would have lived forever in a fallen condition, in a sinful state, in a rebellious state to God. That would have been a horrific existence, and it would have made people over time more wicked than anybody can even imagine because it just would have, they would have got worse and worse and worse. So out of God's goodness and his mercy, He drove them out of the garden so that they wouldn't partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and be stuck in a uh, in a horrible situation for all eternity, right? And uh, God's plan started at that point. Actually, of course, we know God's plan started before He ever created man. He was not surprised because Jesus was the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, right? Jesus was slain before anything else happened. Jesus had already decided before time started, Jesus said, I'm going to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He had decided to give his life to redeem us. So when man fell, something happened spiritually. He handed his spiritual authority over to the devil. He handed the dominion that had been given to him, and he took it by subordinating himself to Satan, and he gave it to Satan, right? And, uh, you know, some people want to argue about this, but it's so clear in Scripture. Um, both Satan and Jesus confirm this was the case. In Luke chapter 4, how many of you know Jesus went into a 40-day fast and the devil came to tempt him? And one of the temptations, and the Bible says the devil came to tempt him, which means these had to be real temptations. If they weren't real temptations, then the Bible would have lied about that, and we know that's not true, right? So Satan came to to tempt Jesus. And one of the temptations he gave him was in Luke chapter four and verse six, he says, the devil said this to him, all this authority, in the the verse previous, he, he, in a moment of time, shown him all the kingdoms of planet earth, everything. And he said this in Luke four, six, and the devil said to him, all this authority, I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all we all will be yours. 
This was a legitimate temptation, wasn't it? The devil had come. The devil had been given uh, dominion over the earth, and he came to Jesus to tempt him. Of course, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. What was the devil really saying to Jesus? If you serve me, I'm going to give you a shortcut, and you don't have to go through the cross. How many of you know that shortcut would have short-circuited the entire plan of redemption, and Jesus was not tempted by what, I mean, it was a temptation, but Jesus was victorious over this temptation, wasn't it? It was a real temptation because Satan really did, had been given dominion by man. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the Bible says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. One, one translation says the God of this world. So when Adam handed the dominion over to the devil, the Bible says that Satan became the God of this world, okay? Now, is he God? Is Satan a God? No, he's not a God. But he's been able to enjoy an illegal authority that he's been able to exercise on the planet and on mankind. But I want you to know in the light of eternity, it's a tiny microcosm because it's going to come to a very rapid and destructive end for the devil. Amen? Amen? And that rebellion will be crushed and put down forever. And the sons of God will reign with God forever and ever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Amen. Romans chapter 6 says this in verse 16, continuing to confirm along the same line. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? Okay? So what is Romans 6 saying? It's saying when Adam decided to yield to the devil and to sin and to follow the devil, he handed over his dominion and authority and he became a slave of the devil, right? Now, when you realize the fact that God is not in in control of everything happening on this planet, it begins to unlock your consciousness to the fact that God is a good God. Look, it's, it's a tough conversation to have with people who believe that everything that happens is because of God, that God is a good God at least not by our definition. I mean, look at the 20th century. I think there was 120 million people killed in wars or more in the 20th century alone by the isms, communism, socialism. By the way, if you want socialism, all you got to do is look at the list of countries that's ever worked in. Oh, wait a minute. None of them. None of them is it ever worked in. Socialism, look up Winston Churchill's quote on socialism and you'll Hopefully you'll abandon that because it's not biblical, it's not God, and it never works. Uh, Socialism is great until you run out of other people's money, which happens very quickly. And then uh, the average Venezuelan has lost like uh, 40 pounds, and they didn't want to lose the 40 pounds. They already were skinny. They're starving to death. I'm telling you, God's not in that. So anyway, but in the 20th century, there were all these people that, that died and how could, you make, how could you make the case that God is a good God when all these horrific wars and destruction is happening? It's because God wasn't in control. Demonically inspired, possessed people like Hitler were in control um, starting these wars and people. And, you know, we're going to look at how the spirit realm has impacted the natural world. But God is a good God. And that's not just a cliche. I'm telling you, church, he really is a very good God. He's not, look, he is not killing people to try and teach somebody something. Look, we, you know, if you're a parent, you don't, um, to teach your kids something, you don't take your car and run over their legs and break their legs and say, I'm just trying to teach them something. That's not how you teach your kids, right? If it is, you, you go to jail for child abuse. If all the things that people have said about God were true, then he would need to be locked up in a cell and the key thrown away. But he's not that God. People have attributed the work of the devil to God. And that's one of the things the devil loves to do. He loves to come and steal, kill, and destroy in somebody's life and then point to God and say, God did it and run away and leave that person thinking, God doesn't love me. God doesn't care. God isn't a good God. I'm telling you, he's a liar. Don't believe him. God is a good God. And we're going to see how God set things up because of love. Okay? So the question is, here's a couple questions. Why did God make a world where we have free will and can choose good or evil to empower God or empower the devil? Why would he do such a thing? The second question is, uh, why was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil even in the Garden of Eden, right? Uh, 
which opened the door to Satan's ministry of stealing, killing, and destroying after Adam's sin. Why would God put that there? Good question, right? Let's talk about it. Um, God had, could have made several worlds. He could have made se- several different ways he made the world. One of them he could have d- done is one where he, we had no ability to know good from evil and therefore were, were incapable of sin. He could have created a world where we were morally ambiguous. We couldn't tell good from evil. Therefore, we were we are incapable of sin. But he didn't create one that way. You know, a world like that. We'll get to the next. The next one is he could have created one where there was no way for us not to choose God. In other words, it appeared to be a choice, but there really wasn't a, a choice. Uh, for instance, if he would have made the Garden of Eden and not put the tree of the knowledge of the fruit of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, guess what? There would be no choice because you could not choose God. You, your only choice would be God, right? And so he put the tree there so there would be a choice. The third kind of world he could have made is one where in theory there was a choice, but our obedience was compelled. In other words, we would just be pre-wired that we would all choose the same thing. We would all choose God and we would not choose the wrong things. And then, finally, the fourth type of existence a world God could have made is one like we really have today, right? And that is a world where we have, um, where we truly possess free will, and we have the ability to choose. And the question is, why would God create a world um, where we have the ability of, to choose? And the reason is, of the four possibilities I just mentioned, only a world like we have where we truly have freedom to choose is love possible. Only where there is true freedom of choice is love possible. Earlier today in this church, there was a wedding. Now, a wedding is a ceremony of covenant where two people who are in love and who have decided to spend the rest of their lives together, come to, and it's a male and a female. So that's on the tape, and I don't care who doesn't like it. It's a male and a female. It's not two females and a male. It's not two males and a female or anything else. It's one man and one woman, biblically speaking. Okay? And that's the only kind of marriage there is. Anything else is not a marriage in God's sight. So one man and one woman coming together in covenant to spend forever together to spend their lives together. And here's the thing. They choose each other, don't they? Nobody twists anybody's arm. Nobody says, you've got to do this. It's because the two people fell in love and decided, you know what? This is the person I want to spend forever with. Amen. And guess what? The bride walks down the aisle. Nobody drags her down the aisle. She's not pushed down the aisle. She's not dragged down the aisle. Of her own free volition, she decides to walk down the aisle. And of both of their own free will, they make a decision to make a covenant before God and man and come together in holy matrimony. Amen? And, and if, uh, if, there's, if it's a good wedding, a set of good wedding vows, it's going to say something to the effect, the effect that... Uh, I forsake all others, and um, let's see, let's see. Part of the scriptural set of wedding vows is something to the effect that I am forsaking all others to devote and give myself to this man, this woman, for the rest of my life. Amen? It's a covenant. It's a lifelong decision, and it's a choice. It's a choice. Nobody is making it happen. It's a choice. Listen, God didn't want a bunch of robots. God didn't want a bunch of people that have been compelled to love him, to compelled to be his sons and daughters. God wanted people who out of their own free will saw what a good God he is and chose him. People that chose to love him. He wanted a family. That's what God is after. He's after a family. Now, I want you to know something. God has already exercised his own free will and he's already made his choice. Did you know that? He's already made his proposal. And he's made this proposal to every human being on planet earth with no exceptions whatsoever. Why do we know this? John three sixteen. for God so loved the what, church? 
the world. He loved everybody. He loves everyone. Everyone is included in God's choice. John 15, 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Jesus chose us. Think about that. You may think you decided one day to get saved. You didn't decide anything. I'm telling you what, God's love and God's power drew you to him. No man can come to God unless the Holy Spirit draw him. Amen? 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all, all, all. Did you see that? All. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, God made a plan and he planned to redeem every single person on planet earth who, who will ever live and ever heart, have a heartbeat on this planet. God wants to redeem them and has already paid for their redemption. Matter of fact, in Matthew 25, when we read about hell, we find out that hell was created for the devil and his angels. God never intended any human being to go to hell. Did you know that church? I said, did you know that church? He didn't want anybody to go there, not one person. Now, unfortunately, we know that people reject Christ and then they die and where do they go? They don't go to heaven. Everybody isn't automatically saved. Everybody's salvation is paid for. I want to be real clear about this. Jesus paid for sins and sin. Sins are transgressions, acts of unrighteousness. He also paid for sin, the evil nature. Because when you're born again, you get a new nature. You become a son and daughter of God. You're a new creation, one that never existed before. He took care of that for every person who would ever live past, present, and future. Right? But the Holy Spirit has come to convict of one sin. John 14 talks about this. Of sin, the Bible says, how be, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will come to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Remember this passage? And then he goes into more detail. He says, of sin, because they believe not on me. Now, I'm telling you, it is a fruitless endeavor to, ba- to hit sinners over the head and tell them they shouldn't be doing this sin, this sin, and this sin. Listen, they got the life and nature of the devil. They're going to act like the devil. You can't fix, you can't polish up a pig, Right? They need, they need to become a new person. And the only way they can get their conduct right, what they're doing is change who they are. And listen, they can't change who they are. There's only one that can t- change the nature of a man, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. There's only one religion that's not a religion. It is a relationship with the Most High God that has the power to transform a human being from the inside out, and that is the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can get a brand new heart. He will take out the stony heart and put in you a heart of flesh. He'll give you a brand new heart. And guess what? Then you'll actually have a heart for the things of God because that comes as part of the package. Isn't that good news? (laughs) So our gospel is not going out telling people you shouldn't be doing this and that. Our gospel, right, is preaching to people the good news that Jesus has paid the price for everybody's sin. You're already included All you have to do is receive this free gift by confessing with your mouth and believing in your heart and turning away from your old life and turning to God. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. That's good news. That's the gospel. That's what saves us. That's what transforms us. Now, so we understand um, that God gave mankind free will. Um, The unfortunate side effect of giving people free will is that they have the power to choose evil. How many of you know that? And you could just check with yourself and know that's true, right? So, uh, which byproduct of evil is what? Killing, stealing, and destroying. That's the outcome of evil is stealing, killing, and destroying. If the devil's trying to show you a rosy future serving him, let me tell you how it ends every single time. Stealing, killing, destroying. There's no other outcome. There's no ifs, ands, or buts. That is the road, and that's where it ends. And the only person who can take you off it is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's a master of taking you off that road and giving you a new life. Amen? He's wonderful. Now, think about that. So we have free will, 
Uh, and, and not only do we have free will, but after the fall, until someone is born again, the Bible says they are children of the devil and the lusts of their father they will do, right? Which is why the world is in such a mess. Now, some people like to say cliche things like, everybody's just a child of God. No. <laughs> if you say that, then you're, you haven't read the Gospels. I'm sorry, you need to read what Jesus said. He did not say that, did he, church? He said something totally different. John 8, 44. Here's what Jesus said. Now, this is in red. This is our Lord speaking. Here's what he said. And he was talking, now interesting, he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees of his day, right? These were the religious leaders, but how many of you know, before Jesus went to the cross, not one person was born again. So what did everybody have? The life and nature of the devil, right? Even if they were looking forward by faith to the coming Messiah, they hadn't experienced vitally the new birth yet. They had not been born again. And so they were trying, and that's why, they were governed by a covenant that was like a big fence. What are the Ten Commandments? It's a big fence to keep you out of trouble because your inside is rotten and I can't fix your inside until Jesus goes to the cross, right? So God put this big fence around man mankind called the Ten Commandments. Hey, don't do these things. Stay in this fence. I'm trying to keep you from totally self-destructing and everybody just self-destructing until Jesus gets here and gets you out of this mess and fixes you on the inside. Aren't you glad? Praise God that we live in the new covenant and we get fixed on the inside. We get a new heart. We get a brand new life. We become a new species. Hallelujah. That's wonderful. So here Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and he says some really nice things. You know, some people want to say that Jesus was tactful. I when they say that, I know they haven't read the Gospels. They've like never read the Gospels or they've been, they've been um, listening to the hyper grace message and they just stop reading their Bible because John 8, 44, Jesus says this, you are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Amen? Now, so think about this. So through our sin and rebellion to God, it, it, it affected mankind in multiple arenas, in multiple planes of existence, right? We lost our status as the sons of God. We came, became children of the devil, right? We received the life and nature of the devil. So instead of having a nature to serve God, we, be, we had a nature of rebellion. The nature of rebellion is the manifestation of a child of the devil. That's what the devil does best is rebel. That's what those that have that nature, that's what they want to do because they need a new nature. And all of us needed a new nature at some point, didn't we? <laughs> Amen. Oh, I was just born saved. No, you weren't. <laughs> at some point you had to say, Jesus, I see my ugliness and I need your help. Some of us, it was so clear, you didn't even need much help, right? You're like, I'm a professional sinner. I need some help here, bad Lord. Amen. So Jesus came to pay our sin debt, make us a new creation, and restore our lost dominion and authority. So when he came, he had to fix a bunch of messes. We made a bunch of messes. Matter of fact, everything that we could mess up, we messed up. But how many of you glad that he can fix up more than we can mess up? <laughs> I'm telling you. He can't, you can't outdo him. He's going to outdo you in his love and grace. Amen. So listen, the reason dominion over the powers of darkness is such a crucial subject for the church is whoever rules spiritually controls the affairs of men and nations. Okay. Whoever rules spiritually controls the affairs of men and nations. And if you have one person that's weaker and one person is stronger, but the stronger person does not exercise their dominion by default, who rules? The weaker, right? So all that uh, evil men need is for good men to do nothing. So let's look at who our battle really, really is with. Um, Ephesians 6.12. I'm going to read this in two different translations. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. This is the J-E-R translation. It says, for it is not against human entities that we have to struggle, but against the sovereignties and the powers who originate the darkness in this world, the spiritual army of evil in the heavenlies. 
This is the P-H-I-L translation. For our fight is not against any physical enemy. Let me say that again, just for our nation. For our fight is not against any physical enemy. It is against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are up against the unseen power that controls this dark world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. In the King James, it says, for we wrestle not against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness in high places, right? And we, we wrestle against, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against those things, right? So the word fight and struggle translated in this word, in, in, this, in these passages, is translated for the word wrestle in the King James. And the word wrestle in this Greek word means to engage in intense struggle involving physical or non-physical force against strong opposition to struggle to fight. We have an enemy church and we are at war. The Bible says so. Our battle is a spiritual one and we must recognize that what we see in the natural is simply a symptom of what is going on in the spiritual. Did you hear me? What we see in the natural is simply a a symptom or byproduct of what's happening in the realm of the spirit. Because look, the spirit realm has dominion over the natural realm, not vice versa. Now, we need to see this. So turn over to Ezekiel 28 for a second. I want to show you this concept of a dual kingdom. There's a kingdom in the seen realm of the five physical senses. What we can hear, taste, smell, touch, right? All these things. And you know, what we can see, hear, feel, taste, touch, the five physical senses or the sense realm. Now, if you go to any college or university, they can only tell you about knowledge they've acquired from the five physical senses. The wonderful thing about Jesus is he peeled back the realm of the kingdom of God and the the spirit realm and showed us what really governs the realm of the five physical senses. So the realm of learning of the five physical senses is a lower realm of knowledge. It's not a useless realm of knowledge, but it's a lower realm of knowledge. The knowledge of God revealed in the Bible and revealed by Holy Spirit is a higher level of knowledge that can have massive impact in lives and nations. Amen? In Ezekiel 28 here, I'm going to start with verse 2 and then jump to verse 9. This is God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel to take up a lamentation against the prince of Tyre. He says, son of man, say to the prince of Tyre, blah, 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 go down to verse 9. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? But you shall be a man and not a God in the hand of him who slays you. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. So there's a prince of Tyre who's a flesh and blood ruler of Tyre that you can go back and read all the details about, but he has got lifted up in pride and a judgment is being pronounced upon him by the prophet Ezekiel. He's a wicked ruler. Verse 12, now God speaks to Ezekiel again to address something different. Ezekiel 28, 12, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. Notice, not prince of Tyre, king of Tyre. Thus says the Lord God, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now, this second person being addressed had walked in the midst of the fiery stones. They were. They had musical instruments in their body, right? They were a internal, they had strings and percussion built right into their body. They were, this person was a living, breathing, moving orchestra of, of, of worship and music, right? 
This is talking about devil. This is talking about Lucifer. He was in the garden. We know the prince of Tyre was not in the garden. The time, he would have had to be too old. So he wasn't talking about the Prince of Tyre. This second address is made to the realm of the spirit. This is made to the devil. And God is talking to the uh, the devil through the prophet Ezekiel in the second path, or second um, passage of scripture, right? So the first passage of scripture, he's addressing a natural human being. The second passage of scripture there in Ezekiel 28, he's addressing the spiritual force that is behind the Prince of Tyre which was the devil himself. Amen? Now, um, Daniel chapter 10. Move over to Daniel 10 for a second. Now, a lot of you have read this passage in Daniel 10. It's a very powerful passage of Scripture because it's one of the first times we really get to see deeply into the realm of the Spirit. In Daniel chapter 10, verse 11. Now, Daniel has set his heart to uh, receive from heaven, to get an answer to prayer. And he's fasting and praying 21 days. And in Daniel chapter 10, verse 11, is, and he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Verse 13, but the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, and behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Verse 20, then he said, do you not know why have I have come to you? And now I must return to fight with the prince of Persia, And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. Now, as we read this passage, it's a very revealing passage of scripture of what's going on behind the scenes in the heavenlies. Daniel's praying and fasting. From the split second, Daniel began to pray and fast. Heaven dispatched his answer. Isn't that good news? Heaven was not slack. Heaven was not messing around. God was not like, ah, we'll get to it eventually. From the millisecond, I believe, the Adam, that, that Daniel started his prayer, immediately God was on it. I said, the second you started your prayer, God was on it. Amen? But we see that Daniel, the prophet Daniel, had grit and perseverance. Grit and perseverance. He persevered and he didn't give up. He refused to quit. He refused to throw in the towel. He refused to give up on heaven. And on the 21st day, he's beside the river praying and an angel appears to him. And people say, well, I don't see people falling out in the Bible like they do in some of those meetings where people fall over. That's because they haven't read their Bible. (laughs) Because right here when this angel appears to Daniel, he fell out. (laughs) He fell out under the power. And then the angel touched him and he came back up. You know, people are worried about people falling out. When they start coming back up, that's going to get my attention, right? (laughs) Go down, then all of a sudden they come back up. But this angel appears to Daniel and says, hey, I came the very day that you started to pray. He even makes this statement that's so powerful. He says, I am come for your words. Church, that we would realize that our words have the power to release angels on our behalf. When we speak, he said, I'm come for your words. Wow, is that not powerful? He said, but the prince of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now listen, this can't be a natural person because if you try and get a natural person in a fight with an angel, natural person is dead. Toast, history, kaput. Why do I know this? Because there was one little a angel. Can you say little a angel? In the Old Testament, that in one night killed over 180,000 of Israel's enemies. I think with the Syrians. It just, one night, just boom, 180,000. 180, I did the math on that one time and uh, said, okay, eight hours, 180, whatever thousand it was. And it was 6.4 KPS, 6.4 kills per second. That's moving pretty quick. <laughs> And it may, it, may, it may have happened in just a split second. Who knows how fast it happened? Bottom line is, one of these angels 
You and I cannot contend with angels. We try and contend with angels, we're going to be in big trouble. So what I'm what was the prince of Persia? This was a demonic ruler that was ruling over the nation, the re- region of Persia that was fighting the answer to Daniel's prayers because hell does not want you to get your answer or the revelation you need. You see how powerful perseverance and grit is. And this angel tells Daniel, I was in this battle 21 days with the prince of Persia and I decided to call Michael and Michael came and helped me and here I am. So Michael is an archangel. He's bad to the bone. You don't want to mess with him, right? When Michael shows up, shows up, uh, hell, hell is, is going to get hurt bad. <laughs> so anyway, he, sh- he shows up and he begins to unveil mysteries and secrets to Daniel concerning what Daniel was seeking God about. Isn't that awesome? He came and he got this supernatural revelation. And then the angels, and and Daniel mentions the prince of Persia, the kings of Persia, right? So there was kings, there's a prince. We're talking about multiple demonic entities. And even mentions in the end, the prince of Greece. He said, he's gonna come fight with me too. I gotta go fight with these guys when I'm done here, right? And so Daniel was saying, there is a spiritual war going on in the heavenlies that is is happening concerning these prayers. And, you know, I was hindered, but God sent reinforcements, and here I am, and here's your answers. And, and so when you realize this, it's clear that these demonic entities were ruling over these natural regions, and they did not want the kingdom of God to invade. Invade, amen? They didn't want uh, God's people to know the vital things they needed to know. They didn't want them operating in dominion and authority and power. They didn't want them taking their seat of authority of who they are in Christ because they knew if they understand these things, it's over for the devil. I said it's over for the devil. Amen? So um, there are strongholds over regions and nations because of the influence of these evil entities and because the people that live in these regions have chosen to agree with these spirits and empower them. Now, how, we, we know every, and I'm going to get into it. I haven't got into what Jesus did to the devil because this was pre-cross. We're going to talk about post, post-cross later about how Jesus defeated the devil. But one of the things that is true is if the people of a region agree with the mindset of a principality and power, they actually enthrone and give power to that false entity to have dominion and rule because of their agreement with it. Amen? Even though it's a false ruler and it's a false principality and power. And this is why in many regions you can go, I I was in outside sales for 13 years where I drove our city street by street, business to business in our region. And I, I just used it to fine tune my spirit where I could be driving through any part of the city and I'd know instantly what sin was prevalent in that area, what darkness was ruling in that area, what was going on in that area. And it didn't take rocket science. You wouldn't have to have a ton of spiritual discernment to see the natural presentation of what's going on in the spirit. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Why is that? Because how, now, how many of you remember Jesus with the madman of Gadara? The madman of Gadara said, please don't send me out of this region. Don't send us out of, not the madman of Gadara, the demons in him. Please don't send us the legion. Don't send us out of this region, right? Why? Because demons like certain territories, right? They want to stay in a certain territory. But praise God, we have dominion. We have authority. We're finding out who we are and what we have. The church is rising up. The church is waking up. And we're taking our seat of authority, dominion, and power over all the powers of hell. Amen? And uh, next week, we're going to start getting into what Jesus did. I'll just leave you with this one statement. Our enemy has been defeated and disarmed, which means if he was floating in water, His name would be Bob. Let's pray.